over here. All right, I think we're working. I am Drew Badger, the English Fluency Guide, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to another live video here on YouTube. This should be a good one. We're talking about ways to respond fluently in conversations. I know this is a really big common problem that a lot of people have. Uh, and so we want to talk about specifically not just learning vocabulary, but how to actually communicate, how to have better conversations and to not feel really nervous when speaking or, you know, feel like you can't say anything because ah, your mind gets stuck and you don't really know exactly how to express yourself. So hopefully it looks like, all right, so we should have some people in the chat right now. But it looks like we're doing all right. I want to get right into it. Uh, hopefully this video will not be very long. Again, usually what I do is try to have my lesson at the beginning and then I'll stay around to answer questions if people have them. Uh, but it's nice to see you there. Everybody, uh, I'll come back and answer questions later if you have questions as I go through these. Also, I'll ask you to do some commenting uh, because this will uh, help you communicate better. It will give you some good practice. All right, so the three basic things I want to talk about in this video, these are going to be three strategies, very simple things that you can do right now, today, in your conversations, even right after you finish this video, it will help you feel more confident, uh, and also over time. So we want to give you some things like some quick wins. This just means something that you can feel great about right now that will help you again in your conversations today, uh, but also help you for your conversations in the future. So really show you how to learn the language well so you communicate in general uh, more fluently. So the first thing you can do very simply uh, is to mirror people, to mirror what people say, to mirror. So just put number one up here, make sure people can see that. All right, to mirror what other people are saying. Now this is a very simple thing you can do. All you can really do is, uh, or all you have to do, I should say, uh, is just repeat what the other person says. Now there are a lot of good reasons to do this, but the most important, number two and one, uh, are number one, that you can really have empathy with the other person. It shows that you're a good listener and really they want to speak with you more if you are listening more. Uh, and then the second thing that's really important about this is that it doesn't stop the flow of the conversation. And it doesn't matter, you don't need to know any phrases or prepare anything beforehand. So this should be a really simple way for you to communicate uh, and just being in the conversation with the other person. Really you're focusing on listening uh, and again, you're just repeating what people are saying. Uh, so I'll go back in just a second and look at comments, but I want to give uh, a very simple, quick example of this and then let you uh, kind of have a conversation with me. So as a simple example, I might say, let's say, uh, let's say tomorrow I am going to the beach. Let's see, to the beach. So if I'm in a conversation with someone and I tell them, hey, Tomorrow I am going to the beach. A very simple way they can respond to this is just repeating back to me what I just said. The beach. Very easy. Now I know this is very simple, but a lot of students forget to do this because they, they are, uh, the English expression we use here is to be in your own head. So to be in your own head means you're spending a lot of time worrying, you're trying to listen to what the other person is saying, and you want to think about what you want to say next. So my advice really is to clear your mind, really try to pay attention to what the other person is saying. Just relax. Don't worry about having a perfect response to people. Just listen really to what they're saying and try to get the other person to speak. This advice is particularly important for people who feel very shy, but you're in the conversation, someone is saying something to you and you have to respond or maybe you will feel nervous about that. So the easiest, simplest thing you can do is simply to repeat back what the other person is saying. And you can ask this like, oh, the beach? So you're asking a question without making a long question. All you're doing is having a rising intonation, like you're asking a question. Oh, the beach? 
and then you just pause and let the other person explain more. That's all you're doing. So you're trying to get more information from the other person and you're letting the other person speak because people love to talk about themselves and explain what's happening. And so you can do this and you will actually be seen as a greater conversationalist. So a conversationalist is someone who can have good conversations and really this is just by listening, even if you're not saying anything. So really pay attention for key words in what they are saying. Forget about your own thoughts or trying to prepare responses or anything really focus on the other person. It's much easier and you can relax. You can get out of your own head and not worry about what you are trying to say. All right. So tomorrow I am going to the beach. Now I could also change the focus of this. I could, instead of talk about where they're going, I could say, oh, tomorrow. So I'm focusing on tomorrow. So maybe I thought like they're going on a different day or something. It doesn't really matter, but I can change the focus of what I want them to speak about by what word I repeat. But notice I don't have to think of my own phrases. I don't need to remember any vocabulary. The point is again, number one, to keep the conversation flowing. And number two, just to get more rapport in the conversation, rapport. So rapport is your connection with the other person. Your rapport is the connection you have with the other person. So if you are thinking about what you want to say next and you're not really listening to the other person, then of course they won't feel listened to. They won't feel listened to and they won't really want to talk with you more. So you want to get more people relaxing, more people uh, using their vocabulary, uh, whether it's a native speaker or not, but getting them to speak. You see how easy this is though? You're really just repeating back what the other person said, usually asking as a question. Now, you can also use this, so the same thing, you're just taking these things. Let's say they ask you a question. So they're asking me a question in this situation. Oh, what are you doing tomorrow? So what are you doing tomorrow? I can say, same thing. Tomorrow, I'm just giving myself time to think. <laughs> so even in the conversation, I, maybe I don't remember. Because remember that native speakers are having these same things in conversations as well. So they might not remember what they want to say in a conversation, okay? So they're thinking, okay, uh, someone asks me like, hey, what did you have for dinner yesterday? What did you have? What did you eat for dinner yesterday? What did you eat for dinner yesterday? And I'm thinking, yesterday? yesterday. So I'm kind of asking myself as a question uh, and usually people people feel the need to, to say something, to have some kind of sound coming out uh, because if they don't do that then the other person will just start speaking again. This is why people usually say uh or um and these using these filler words just to have some voice or some kind of sound coming out so that the other person doesn't just get into the conversation and continue talking. So if a waiter comes up and asks, oh, what would you like for lunch? I might be thinking, oh, what would I like for lunch if I don't know? So I'm, I'm, I just, I repeat the conversation or repeat the question back to myself. So again, this works whether you're using it just as a way to, to kind of pause or slow down the conversation or as a way to get more information from the other person. Now this is great practice, just listening to what the other person says because remember the real practice that you get that builds your fluency is from what other people say to you, especially native speakers. So you really want to get more details about the information. Oh, you're going to the beach? Now if you're feeling a bit more confident, you can ask, oh, which beach? Which beach? Or you can ask a question about this like, are you going with anyone? Are you going with anyone? Okay. But again, the point is that this is the, the really magical, simple thing you can do where you don't need to remember or prepare anything. There's nothing you need to think about like, okay, do I, do I remember the right words or phrase before you get into the conversation? All you're doing is listening and repeating back to people what they say.
Okay, so right now I'd like to do this with you. I'm going to have a conversation with you and I'd like you to just type in the chat, just respond back to me using this same simple idea just to make sure everybody understands what I'm doing. I know this is a very simple exercise, but it's important and it will hopefully get you doing it automatically. It will feel much more confident or you will feel much more confident. You will feel more comfortable in conversations uh, if you can start doing this. So tomorrow I'm going to the circus. 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 So imagine I've just said that to you. Just type a response using my words back to me in the conversation. All right, so keep the conversation flowing by typing in the chat right now a response to me. So tomorrow I'm going to the circus. The circus. Tomorrow I'm going to the circus. Tomorrow I'm going to the circus. Just type in the chat right now. Just make this very easy. Tomorrow I'm going to the circus. So I want you to respond to me. Very good. So Christian right there, the circus. Look at that. So basically the same exact thing as this, uh, this example over here. So tomorrow I'm going to the beach. And Christian responds with the beach. But in this one, I'm talking about going to the circus. Yes, I'm going to the circus, okay? So you don't need to respond with exactly the same thing. You could do that. So there are longer ways. I could, I could respond and actually repeat actually the same thing. So tomorrow I'm going to the beach or in the example I just gave, tomorrow I'm going to the circus. I could repeat that whole thing back to you. Oh, tomorrow you're going to the beach. Tomorrow you are going to the beach. So I change the sentence slightly because I'm talking about the other person. But again, I can make that longer if I want to. It's not necessary. Often native speakers are just looking for key information and they're asking for more. Okay. So you're just repeating a little bit back. So tomorrow I am going to the circus. So I want you to respond to me. So uh, Christian already said the circus. So he responded back the circus. Uh, yes, uh, I really like the circus. My favorite animal at the circus is the elephant. I really like the elephants. I really like the elephants. I really like the elephants. Now you can pay attention to what I'm doing here. I'm giving you clues in the conversation about what I'd like to talk about, but I'm looking for you to ask me. All right, Andres, again, the elephants? Yes. So when I was young, uh, I, I used to go to the circus with my dad, uh, and we would love to feed peanuts to the elephants. Okay? So you see how this works? So you can get more information from me. You don't have to continue, like continue repeating or everything like that. If you want more information, that's, that's fine. Uh, again, this is just to keep the conversation flowing and to let the other person speak. Okay? So a couple of you guys have got it there. Pretty easy. All right. Any questions about this? All right. Uh, do that type of questions break the grammar rules? No. Remember that grammar is less important in a spoken conversation, uh, especially if we just want information. But grammatically, I can say like the beach question mark. I can say that. And even in like a novel or a written form, you know, like I would, I would, you know, I, I, I could, I could do that. Uh, if you're writing maybe an essay or something for professional work, uh, maybe you might not want to do that. Obviously, you would have some kind of uh, subject and object, and you're talking about what what the thing is. The point is to be clear. Uh, but in this case, if if we know what we're talking about, that's the whole point of the conversation. So just to keep the conversation moving, and just asking for key information. Uh, where you're getting that response from the other person. So I feel excited because I said, yeah, I really like the elephants. And most people will like to continue talking about things if you let them. But most people do not. They, are, they, want, to, like, they want to say something in the conversation. So a conversation becomes much more enjoyable, especially if you are feeling shy, if you just let the other person speak and let them continue to speak by you directing them. And if you listen for the key words, their intonation, what they're interested in talking about, uh, then they will obviously feel more confident about speaking, all right? So the mirror technique, very simple. You're really just repeating back to other people what they're saying. 
All right, and then again, you can, you can, if you're feeling more confident, obviously you can bring up your own stories or you can ask different questions. I just wanted to start this lesson in this video with something very, very simple that anyone can do. So even if you don't feel confident about making your own sentences or you're worried about how do I, how do I have maybe five or 10 words, I don't want to give you a long list of phrases or something that you need to remember. The point is the information is right here in the conversation already. So if you're just listening to people, you will become a better listener and you will improve your fluency uh, and have better rapport at the same time in a conversation. So let me go back and make sure I don't like the beach. Yes, so I'm surprised a shark would not like the beach, but it happens. Now maybe you like the beach, sharks like the beach, so they can come up and you know get the, get the swimmers who are by the beach. But even if you don't like the beach, you can certainly use that in a conversation. So if I say, oh, I'm going to the beach, but then you say, oh, I don't like the beach. <laughs> You're kind of ending the conversation right there. So often uh, in conversations, you can talk about things or get the other person to speak more, even if you don't care about that thing. So an example, uh, I might be talking with my daughters about something they are interested in, but maybe I don't really care about. So they bring me, look, daddy, here's a, here's a doll that I'm playing with. And I say, oh, like, tell me about the doll. And I'm asking them questions about that. Part of that is for me to give them lots of input uh, so that I can help them improve their listening and their, their fluency as well. But also I, I'm just encouraging them to speak. So encouraging them to, to feel confident about that. So even if I don't really care about a doll, I don't have a doll myself, I don't do anything with that, uh, but it's important to the other person and that's okay. All right. So remember, again, there are lots of good reasons to do this, but this is very simple. Anybody can do this in a conversation. Any questions about this? Let me know. I think people got it though. All right. I haven't been to any one of the circuits. You can also, yeah, so you can, you can ask again, like same questions about that. Let's see why we don't use the future tense. Well, again, this, there's nothing about like uh, tenses. You don't have to think about any of that in, in this example. All right, so it's understood that they will be going to the beach from this. So tomorrow I am going to the beach, like I am going, uh, it's, it's just another way of saying you will be going to the beach because you are not doing it right now, you're talking about when you will do it. So tomorrow I will go to the beach. You can use both of those. All right. Remember, there are usually more than one way uh, or there are often many ways to express yourself in a conversation. Okay. So when we're talking about the future tomorrow, I will go to the beach or tomorrow I am going to the beach. You can use both of those. All right. This is why we put tomorrow in there. If you just say I am going to the beach, it means I am doing that right now. But if we talk about when we are doing it next week, I will be going to the beach or I will go to the beach or I am going to the beach, okay? Often we, we use the, the kind of present continuous like that to just make it sound more like it's, it's happening and it's, it's something we're doing right now, even though we're not physically going to the beach right now, okay? I think we got any questions. And conditional, uh, what specifically? So if, again, like it, the, the point is to listen for the key words in what people are saying, because it doesn't matter what the tense is or whatever, this could be about the past. Yesterday, I went to the beach. Okay, so yesterday I went to the beach, I can still respond in the same way because this is about uh, keywords. Oh, the beach? So yesterday I went to the beach. Oh, the beach? Tomorrow I will go to the beach. Oh, the beach? The response is still the same. It doesn't matter what the tenses are. Uh, or like if you want to use a conditional, we're talking about like if I do something. So if I go to the beach, then I will do this. So I could say, oh, like the beach or, 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 or I could be talking about what they, what, they're, what they want to talk about. So if I go to the beach, I will surf. If I go to the beach, I will surf. And I could say, oh, you will, you will surf or surfing. All right, so I'm just, I'm asking without, without making a longer question that could be grammatically correct, I don't have to worry about that. Again, uh, this, this specific thing, this specific idea about mirroring is for people who really don't have uh, a lot of confidence about making longer sentences or having more information in the conversation. So you can respond simply without having a whole bunch of things to say. 
Okay, so you see how easy this is? So this is not about like, I could ask a longer thing. Oh, tomorrow, if you will go to the beach, what will you do if, if it's raining? So I could answer something and, and go on and talk about something else. Oh, I remember when I was young, I used to go to the beach all the time. Okay, isn't it dangerous to do surfing for children? I don't know. That's a good question. Dangerous? So look, let's say you just asked me that question. Is it dangerous for children uh, to do surfing? Or is it dangerous for children to surf? A way I could respond to that is just dangerous. And I, then I just wait and let you ask me more questions about that. So is it dangerous for children to surf? Dangerous? So you might be thinking, okay, well, let me, let me think about what I mean by that. Maybe they get, I don't know, maybe they fall off the surfboard or they do something. I don't know. Uh, I've, I took my, my older daughter uh, in Hawaii one year. We, we went, uh, did a little bit of just kind of standing on a board. And obviously she was too young to do it by herself. But standing with me, I could walk her through. Uh, and she enjoyed standing on the, uh, standing on the surfboard. So that was something we could do. So again, I can take a story if I'm feeling confident about telling a story or explaining things in more detail, but I don't have to. You can still keep the conversation flowing just by using the vocabulary that the other person said. Okay, so it doesn't matter what it is. Usually you could go back and, and continue adding more and more things or getting into more detail or doing something else. And then as you feel more confident or you're using other things, you want to tell your own stories, you can do that, all right? But this is great for people who lack confidence and really just want to have more, uh, just better conversations and not feel nervous about, about having to say something, okay? So really just use the other person's words. All right, let me go back before we go to number two. Uh, let's see, if it's raining, you better stay home. Yep. Do you know, uh, speak Spanish a little bit? I can understand some Spanish, but I don't, but I don't speak Spanish. Uh, who are you going, who are going with you? Do you have any company? Yep, you would say like, who is going with you? Or is anyone going with you? Or are you going alone? Are you going by yourself? So there are lots of ways you can do this. And as you listen to more examples of native speakers, you will feel more confident about that. So I could say, oh, you are going to the beach. Like the key word could be like, you know, if someone says tomorrow, I am going to the beach. Oh, I say you are going to the beach. So in that case, they might, they might think, oh, like I'm already asking the question, like who is going to the beach? And I don't mean like, are they going or not? I already know that. But the idea is, oh, like, are they going by themselves or are they not? So I could say, oh, just you. So I, here I'm adding a word, but I'm just, if I want to do that, I could just say, oh, you're, you are going to the beach. So the, the emphasis is on you. You are going to the beach. But again, I'm just using their vocabulary back to them. Okay, I don't need to prepare anything in advance. I don't need to think about anything. Uh, I'm just listening. The whole point is just listening for keywords just to get that conversation flowing. That's it. All right, I think we're doing well. All right, let's see. Uh, what will bring when you go to the beach? Beer? Yeah, so what will you bring? Or will you bring anything? What will you bring? All right, what will you bring? All right, Naz says, I like to learn from lesson and watching, but I have a problem with writing, also with grammar. I understand everything you're saying, but at the same time, my brain stopped. Yeah, so we have lots of lessons that cover like things about even writing, like you should be just uh, actually writing more if you have trouble writing. So find writing that you like and then copy that, like actually write it by hand. Uh, but most of the time, you can, if you'd look on the, the latest videos we have, the latest live videos specifically on the channel, uh, where we talk about fluency. Pretty much every video is talking about fluency. This one is specifically about responding in conversations, so how to answer people, how to respond to people easily. Um, but you will find things, pretty much everybody has the same kinds of problems, and the most basic issue people have with fluency is they just don't know the language as well as they think they do. So they have usually a definition or a translation, but they haven't really gotten enough examples of the language, and that's why they don't speak as well as they like. Uh, speak as well as they would like to. Uh, all right. So I would love to zip a cup of cappuccino. Uh, sip a cup of cappuccino while I'm at the beach. 
Should we prepare food before we go to the beach? Yeah, so people, you can, again, there are other things you can add. You can ask your own questions if you're feeling confident. But if you are not, don't put pressure on yourself. That's the basic idea here. All right, let me go back and make sure before we go on to the second example here. Uh, that I got everybody. Elena says, uh, how can I pronounce the word beach properly without cursing? <laughs> Elena, you should have Frederick, our app. If you do not have that already, click on the link in the description below this video. Uh, I believe beach is in there. If it's not, I think it's in there. Uh, but you will learn other things, even uh, they are related uh, to the E-A sound, beach, like teach. It's the same sound. All right, let's see if anybody else here. All right, so my favorite animal is the shark. Ah, okay, I got you. All right, uh, Sita, it's like you do in your native language when you repeat some parts of your opponent's speech. Yes, so you can call them your opponent, I suppose, or the, just the person you're speaking with. Tomorrow I'm going to the circus. Yeah, so it looks like you guys... You guys got it over here. And if remember, we get lots of questions and comments, so if I don't get to yours, uh, repeat that again. Let's see. What well, Naoko says, good morning from Tokyo. Nice to see you there. From Toronto. Okay, all right, we're going back to the bottom here. All right, what is the difference between will be and going to be? Yes, uh, in this video, I'm not going to cover specific grammar points, uh, but again, we've covered lots of those on the channel already, and this is also the kind of thing we do in Fluent for Life. It's much better to get many examples of things uh, to learn nuances like this rather than try to get a quick explanation because you're just going to forget it anyway. All right, so what we do, we want to give you many, many examples of things, and that's how you understand them. I've watched your videos since many years ago, and I have learned a lot. Thank you so much. Your videos are really helpful. Uh, it's my pleasure, Danielle. Thank you. All right, so moving on to number two. All right, so this is, you can think about kind of the next step up if you're feeling a bit more confident, and this is to respond. Uh, and this could be a respond, or if you're starting a conversation, uh, imperfectly. All right, so the imperfect is important here. Respond imperfectly. Remember that when most people are learning a language, they usually get one example or one definition or one translation of a word, and then they feel that they really need to remember that specific thing. But natives don't learn a language that way. Natives learn situations. They see what happens. A situation like a parent is yelling at a child or a person is ordering some food or I'm talking with my friend and laughing and smiling and answering questions. All of those things begin with a situation and then the vocabulary we use uh, is kind of learned from seeing those many examples. Okay, so here's what I mean by responding imperfectly or just imperfect communication anyway. So by perfect communication, this might be you have an exact word that you want to use and you can use that word uh, perfectly and automatically you can recall exactly what you want to say at the right time in conversations. This is pretty rare even for native speakers. And so what we do instead is we usually, like a native speaker, will have a few different ways of explaining something. And if they can't remember a specific word, they might get stuck for a moment, but usually they switch to something else. And so they will respond imperfectly. Native speakers will still have those same issues that English learners have where they're trying to communicate, but they actually, it's like right now, I don't have a specific lesson plan or an exact thing I want to say. I'm letting my language just flow naturally. So if I can't think of a specific thing, I just switch to something else. I can switch to a different way because again, how I've learned, I'm thinking about situations, specific ideas I want to express, but I know there are different ways of doing that. So I could use this phrase or that phrase or that phrase. So this is a story from yesterday. I was going out with my family. We were going to this uh, blueberry picking place. It's a little bit early in the season here in Japan for picking blueberries. Uh, but we just went to this restaurant. Uh, and my older daughter, Aria, was saying, Oh, I want to go to that American store. I want to go to that American store. So I want to go... To that American store. Are you gonna yell at me for my writing or do I, do I need to make that clear for people? S-T-O-R-E. 
Or is that worse? <laughs> S-T-O-R-E. Store in American. American store, okay? So I was standing there, my wife and I, uh, we were talking and Aria says, I want to go to that American store. And at first, we didn't know what she was talking about. All right, so she was, she was confident, like she had a specific image. Oh, she knows, like she's thinking of a specific store, a uh, space, <laughs> specific store. Uh, so she's thinking about that. I want to go to that American store, but we don't know what you're talking about, or we don't know what she's talking about. So we start asking her some questions. What do you mean American store? What's an American store? And again, we're not, we're not being like, oh no, like that's, like that's a stupid thing. There's no such thing as American store. What are you talking about? We're not getting angry at her. We're just asking, oh, what, what do you mean American store? Because she has in her mind a specific thing she wants to say, all right? But she just doesn't know the name of the store, all right? It's not like the airport or a specific park or something. It's just a place she's been to before, but she calls it or she thinks of it as the American store. And so we begin talking with her and we go back and forth. What do you mean American store? Uh, and she was like, you know, that the place where I got that doll. And we thought for a minute and, oh, okay, yes, I understand now. So that the doll you got, uh, that was at the, it was a mini, mini Costco. Costco. So if you don't know what Costco is, uh, I think they're in various countries, but definitely in the United States, Costco is a place where you can go buy really big, uh, like bulk, B-U-L-K, bulk, bulk items. So a huge container of peanuts or a huge ketchup or something like that. Uh, but so she called that the American store. <laughs> I thought that was very funny when I realized what she was talking about. So in Japan, we do have Costco as well. And it's interesting uh, that, so let's say Costco, I'll just draw this, imagine this is a map. So we have a Costco up here, uh, but we are maybe two or three hours away from Costco. So now recently some, some businesses are opening up where they have, they sell, they basically buy stuff from Costco bring it to another store and then sell it for a slightly high, higher, like higher price. <laughs> All right. So like there's these mini things. So it's like they, I think this, the name of the store is like mini costs or something like that, but it's a miniature, a smaller version of Costco. They go buy some popular things, bring them back here and then sell them for a slightly higher price. All right. So of course, Aria doesn't know the name of that, but she's thinking American store. American store. All right. So she's speaking imperfectly. Obviously the perfect answer would be, oh, can we go to the mini cause? And then, uh, yes. Okay. We understand exactly what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. So there's, uh, yeah, I think there are Costco's in, uh, in different countries. All right. But the interesting thing here is that the only difference between Aria and a non-native speaker is the confidence. That's it. All right, so Aria is not communicating perfectly because she's not using the exact word that we might be expecting, but she has the confidence to continue explaining something. All right, now what most, what, what happens often, uh, very often in conversations is a native speaker might be speaking with a, a non-native, so I'm speaking with a learner, uh, and they say like, oh, I want to go to that American store. So an adult learner says the exact same thing. I want to go to that American store. And I say, oh, what, what, do you, what is an American store? What, what do you mean? And then the person freezes up like, oh, no, I said the wrong thing. Ah, what happened? Okay, but Aria didn't do that. She just said, oh, maybe I should try explaining it in a different way. All right, so this is the courage to respond imperfectly. Remember that there are many ways to explain things, and sometimes if I can't remember the exact word, it's not important. It's not necessary to do that. I just need to explain something, and ah, okay, now I get it, all right? So if you, if you try to explain something, like if I'm trying to explain I forget what a word is in Japanese or whatever, I can, I can go around that by trying to explain it in a different way. And it's just the courage you have to continue going on with the explanation. So the other person usually wants to understand what you're saying. That's the point of a conversation. You're trying to connect with the other person. You're saying something, they're saying something, you're having a back and forth. You want to understand each other. 
And so I want to understand my daughter, and now, ah, so she calls that the American store. All right? Is this sentence, uh, this whole story here, does this make sense? So remember that the only difference is that a non-native speaker might say the same thing, but they would get flustered. It's like, oh no, they're going to start panicking because the other person doesn't know what I'm talking about. Oh no, I, I used the wrong word, oh no. All right? You don't need to do that. You are creating that by getting in your own mind when you start doing that. So it's okay to just try to explain something and do the best you can with the other person. And it's really just your confidence where I'm saying like, yeah, I know, like, what's the name of that thing? And I'm working with the other person. Can you, what's the name of that? Do you know that store we went to? You remember, I got that doll and Noel got a doll too. And we, ah, okay, now we remember. Ah, you're talking about the mini cause, okay? So remember, the confidence is really the thing that, that makes it different. Native speakers are still in these same situations. So native speakers are also communicating imperfectly most of the time. They might have a specific thing they want to say, but it could probably be spoken better, or they could use fewer words or something. There are lots of ways that you could make uh, communication more perfect or more efficient, but most people don't communicate that way. Okay, so don't put pressure on yourself. Remember, the first thing is just responding to other people by repeating what you have or what you hear from that person. Second thing, if you're feeling more confident, is just trying to express something without doing it perfectly. All right, it's not about making mistakes, it's just about a different way of getting to the same conclusion. All right, so ideally, like let's say you are right here and you want to get to this point, if you can go straight to that with the perfect language, that would be great. But it doesn't matter if you need to go around here and come back, you still get to the same place. And often you have a good connection with the other person as you try to figure that out. But don't feel bad about that. Any questions about this? All right, let me go back before we go into number three, which is a little bit uh, even higher level for even stronger students, uh, but that's really what you should be doing, or this is what you should be doing, what I'll explain in a moment, uh, to become much more fluent and really be talking about anything you like in these conversations. All right, the chat got a little bit quiet over here, but hopefully everyone is still paying attention. Is everyone asleep or are people there? Is this making sense? Are people feeling a little bit better about conversations now or am I wasting my time? <laughs> Let me know because these are the exact same strategies that I use in my own conversations in Japanese and, and the same things I'm doing uh, teaching my children as well. All right, so I encourage them to find different ways of expressing themselves. There isn't just one way to say things. All right, hopefully this makes sense. If we got no more questions, let's see. All right, to go back through. Let's see, so Julie and the whale beached on the Cornish shore due to dehydration. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Tristan says, you're my savior. Ben, sick to you, uh, stick to your lesson for almost four years now, and I can say I totally communicate like uh, with the native English people. Glad to hear. Bravo, that is good to hear, Tristan. Keep up the good work. Bruno, hey, Drew, what's up? Glad to be in your live lesson. Glad to hear you. Uh, nice to see you there, Bruno. I arrived late. I like your channel. Glad to hear it. All right. Hey, we have 100 people in the live. Yep, yeah, call your friends. They get more people in here. <laughs> Where are my Peruvian students also? I think I had some Peruvian students <laughs> in class uh, one time over there. Uh, Isaac says, pretty easy Japanese. Ha, I just got here too. Uh, do you save this video? Yes, I will save these. Perhaps. Yes, I got the point. What's up? What's up? All right, moving on. So the final level, uh, again, I don't want to cover everything you can do and teach you a whole bunch of phrases. These are usually uh, just principles because a lot of people, they, they want specific phrases you can use in a conversation, but then they just forget those, okay? So in order to actually become a confident speaker, start with these things that will help you improve in your regular conversations. And you will feel much more confident. All right, so the third and final thing we'll talk about here, this is something, uh, if you've been on my channel a while, you should be familiar with this, uh, and this is Naturally Buried Review. All 
Okay, so naturally varied review. What we've talked about for number one, especially, and number two, uh, is that when you're repeating things, you're listening to other people, especially native speakers, in conversations, that's the real practice you're getting with the language. So especially if you talk with 10 people about doing a particular thing, this is getting naturally varied review, where you're hearing one person say something. So let's say I speak with one person about, uh, I don't know, raising pet rabbits or something, or pet frogs or whatever. I'm just, I'm, I'm talking with one person, so this is one person uh, is maybe teaching me about something or I'm talking with them about that thing, even if I don't know much about it. Then I talk with a second person who's going to give me more information about that same thing, but they are going to use that in maybe slightly different ways. They may give me some phrases that are both talking, okay, you need to raise a frog from a tadpole. So a tadpole, like this is a baby, a little, uh, that's a bad picture of a tadpole. <laughs> so you got the little head here and a little, little tail like that. Here's a, a tadpole, a tadpole. So we have, okay, we're learning like this person says tadpole, that person says tadpole as well, and that helps me remember the word tadpole. So rather than just trying to repeat it, put it on a flashcard and review it again and again, I want to listen to lots of people talking about that. So I get a third person that also is explaining to me about how to raise frogs or something. Okay, so notice how like the more overlap there is, the better my fluency becomes. The more overlap there is, the better my fluency becomes about this particular stuff. So if I continue to have more and more conversations, maybe I talk with this person uh, and this person over here. So each of them, like there are some phrases that only this person will use. There are some phrases that only this person will use, but there are some phrases that everybody uses. Okay, so a tadpole is a, is a young frog. So a frog, we got an egg like this, goes into the tadpole form. It grows up into, oh man, this is gonna be a bad picture of a frog. That's a frog. <laughs> All right, and then the frog makes eggs and the cycle goes around like that, okay? So as I'm getting naturally varied review, and this is specifically for building vocabulary, all right? Where I'm listening to different people, it's improving my vocabulary, it's developing my memory, it's improving my listening as well, which also improves my pronunciation, it's teaching me grammar, all of these things it's doing naturally. Without me having to study a bunch of rules, it's by understanding the context of the situation and it's through this process that I build fluency for conversations. So the first thing here we talked about mirroring people means I'm just repeating back what other people are saying. I could be in a conversation in a language I don't even speak. And if I know what the words are, you know, if someone could like tell me, oh, okay, this word means this, like I understand like this is a word, this is a word, I could repeat back to that person and they would, it would feel to them like it's a conversation. All right. So that's what we're doing with mirroring the other person. So even if I have a limited uh, conversation, so maybe I know a lot of vocabulary, which is the case for many learners. So they have a limited uh, active vocabulary. They have a large passive vocabulary, but they don't really feel confident using the vocabulary they have. So mirroring is great for that. Uh, and then if you're feeling a little bit more confident, you can respond imperfectly. So you don't have to put pressure on yourself to say this exact one thing try to explain things, uh, try to communicate in a way that's understandable, even if it's imperfect. And it's your confidence about wanting to explain something that, that will help the other person relax as well. So if you start to panic, oh no, I forgot the specific word I need to say for this, it's, it's okay. You don't need to worry about that. Just like a young child, like I told with that story with my daughter, you're just expressing yourself in a different way. It's not about being incorrect, you're just expressing yourself in a different way. All right, and then naturally varied review. This is where we're getting lots of different input. So all of these are really about improving through input anyway. Even in conversations, you are really just improving your kind of your confidence that you have uh, by feeling more confident about 
like using specific words in a conversation. But that usually comes from you actually understanding that vocabulary really well. And you can do that by yourself. So you don't have to be in a conversation to do this. Just like right now, I'm teaching you things and I'm reviewing things again and again in different ways to help you remember them so that when you are in, uh, when you are in a conversation, you will feel more confident about using these things. All right, so naturally varied review, this is the highest level, and this is really for the, for the long-term fluency development. It's something you can begin doing immediately if you are not doing it already, but this is really how we help people in Fluent for Life. So you begin in the program and you start going through things again and again in slightly different ways. So you might hear the same vocabulary from different people. You might hear it in different tenses. Uh, you might see it like maybe used by a, a person like me if I'm teaching something and then hear it in an actual conversation. So all of these things are giving you lots and lots of review without you needing to respond or actually say anything, all right? The, the actual communication part, it's a very small part of the learning process. And just like me out here, even living in Japan, I don't spend most of my day speaking Japanese. I spend a very little amount of time speaking Japanese. I would say maybe altogether, maybe like it depends on the day i might have a day if i go out with a friend or something maybe i would speak to them for an hour or something in japanese but most days i'm not doing that and if i'm getting any japanese at all it's like reading something or watching something or listening to it rather than me speaking all right so it's because i'm able to understand i feel very confident because i'm getting all this naturally varied review all right let me go back and check questions but that's the basic lesson look at that 45 minutes very good all right, so mirroring, responding imperfectly, and then getting naturally varied review. These are all things that you can do without having to put a lot of pressure on yourself. And again, these, uh, these very simple, three simple things you can do in conversations, or even if you're learning by yourself, you will still get lots of great input and you will still improve your fluency and all these things can work together. All right, uh, is it not persons, it is people. It is not persons, it is people. Uh, I think, I don't know if that's for me or not. Uh, Asina says, thank you, teacher. It is bedtime. I'm getting myself ready for another work day. Uh, it nearly, uh, it is nearly 22 hours in Montreal. All right, uh, is the mirror the same thing as shadowing? Well, shadowing is, is you're, you're repeating after people, like, if, like you're not doing anything even in a conversation. Uh, that's where you're just like, you could be listening to me right now and trying to repeat after what I say, but this is, it's less important, uh, to do that. This is specifically about being in conversations. And this is advice that uh, I would even give to native English speakers just to have better conversations with people. So just having rapport, feeling, uh, confident, making the other people, the other people or person feel listened to. So if they feel listened to, they will, they will enjoy speaking with me more, even if I'm not speaking very much. So a lot of this is just, it's just general advice uh, about communication uh, and conversation specifically. So like you can just by shadowing someone, like repeating back after what they said, um, but you can do that by yourself. I'm talking about in conversations when you want to respond automatically, okay? Do you have an accent? Well, I suppose everybody has an accent. Uh, but I, I try to try to communicate very, very cleanly uh, to make sure all my words are easy to understand, even though I'm blending my speech like a native speaker. Are you American? Yes, I am. Uh, th uh, okay. Got it. All right. Can I you? Okay, thanks. That's that one. Lewis says, I do not have the opportunity to talk with other persons. Ah, okay, maybe that's what that's about. Yes, talk with other people. Yes, again, you don't need to have other people in order to improve your fluency. This video is specifically about people who want to communicate and who are in, uh, like, who do have that opportunity. Um, but again, naturally varied review will get you fluent even if you don't speak with anybody else. Because the whole point of fluency is that you develop an understanding of the language like a native speaker. That's the whole point. So when you understand a language like a native speaker, you can use the language like a native speaker. Okay. So if you're just learning uh, by yourself, you don't have anyone to practice with, uh, then you're just using like translations or trying to learn the, the traditional way by studying grammar rules. Uh, you are going to think about those things when you communicate. But if you're actually learning and trying to understand like a native English speaker, which is what we do with Naturally Varied Review, that's how you can become a fluent speaker by yourself. 
all right? Then when you are in a conversation, you will feel much more confident about speaking and you can follow these simple things in order to do that, all right? So let's say you, you're, you're getting naturally varied review, like you start doing that and in the next you know, 30 days, you're feeling much more confident about using specific vocabulary. When you get in a conversation, you can use that. Or if you're still feeling shy, you don't want to say something, whatever the reason is, you can just mirror the other person or respond imperfectly. All right. Uh, yes, the psychotic teacher is back. What's up? <laughs> All right. Uh, Shivan says, how to be fluent in a long conversation. Yes, this is it. So remember, a long conversation is a series of shorter, like shorter back and forth things like this. So there, there, there's nothing special about like being in a longer conversation rather than a short one. But usually the complaint that learners will have is that the conversation uh, like becomes boring, usually because the learner doesn't have anything to say. So they think, well, I'm like a, a learner says, or a native speaker says, yes, uh, tomorrow I'm going to the beach. And the, the natives and the learner says, oh, okay. <laughs> and so that's the end of the conversation. So, it, I mean, you got to think about it like, like a game of, uh, I don't know, volleyball or something. So you have one person over here and another person over here. First person hits the ball to the other side. <clears throat> now you can respond. <coughs> Excuse me. You can respond by hitting the ball back to the other person. That's what mirroring does. Or you can just let the ball fall down over here and then that's the end of it. So I say, hey, tomorrow I'm going to the beach. So I've hit that over to you. Tomorrow I'm going to the beach. And you say, great. That's the end of the conversation, okay? Or you can respond back, the beach. Well, yes, I like going to the beach. I have been going to the beach uh, since I was a little kid. And so you hit that back, maybe I'm feeling a little bit more confident. I want to respond maybe imperfectly. Oh, what do you like about the beach? Okay, I'm answering them, I'm responding back. Again, the, the length of a conversation increases by going more, usually, usually you go either deeper into something or you're jumping from one topic to the next. That's how you would have a longer conversation. Okay, but it's, it's still using these basic ideas. I don't need to have like advanced uh, vocabulary in order to do that. I'm really just using their vocabulary. I could, I could probably be in a conversation with people uh, and in, uh, in master English conversations. So these are the specific conversation videos that we have in Fluent for Life. Uh, when I'm going in those, I mean, I've spent a long time just having like basically not really interviewing people, but just getting to know them. And so I let them speak, I ask them questions, and I'll often just repeat back what they said to me. So I have been in the army for a long time. Oh, a long time? So I'm looking for more specific information. One person says, I have been in the army for a long time. Now I could respond back to, to different things about that sentence. I could say, oh, the army? So like rather than the Navy or rather than, you know, like the Navy SEALs or whatever, uh, or, you know, something else. So I'm talking about you uh, or I'm talking about the Army or I'm talking about how long they've been doing that thing. So I'm listening to what, to what the other person is saying. I forget myself. I don't worry about what I'm trying to say. I just listen to the other person and continue trying to hit back the thing back to the other person just by using their words. So we can have a long, I could have an hour long conversation with someone just repeating back what they're saying. I usually would not do that. I would like add something or maybe we talk about something else, whatever. But if you're not feeling so confident about that, it's easy just to repeat back what they say. And it's still a great conversation because really the, a great conversation comes from the other person feeling listened to, from them feeling like they got to talk about something. So most people, they will begin a conversation like, hey, like, what's up? Because in a conversation, we expect the other person not to care or to not really be listening or whatever. It's just, hey, what's up? Uh, nothing. <laughs> so what's up? And the other person says nothing. Okay, I guess that's the end of the conversation then. Okay. And like... So I might respond back like, hey, what's up? Nothing. Oh, really? Nothing? 
So I could just, I could repeat this back to them and I'm really getting like, oh, this like, really? Nothing? Like there's nothing happening in your life? <laughs> so the, 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 the goal here is to, to make that person feel confident that they can speak. Okay, so they, they're looking for permission to, to, to actually talk about something because most people don't feel listened to. Okay, so if tomorrow, hey, I'm going to the circus. Wow, the circus? I get excited and just repeat back what they said. Wow, the circus? I added the wow part, but I even if I forget the word wow, just circus, the circus? <laughs> it's the same thing, all right? So hey, what's up? So what's happening? What's going on? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Now this is this is like speaking to to teenagers or to like kind of older children, where I say, "Oh, what did you do at school today?" Nothing. Really? Nothing. You did nothing at school. <laughs> you did nothing. You know what? What are we? What are we? Why are we sending you to school if you don't learn anything? Okay. So we 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 have to kind of go deeper, and we encourage the other person to speak when we do that. That's how we get more information. So when kids feel that they are listened to, they will speak more. But most times parents are like, be quiet. You know, we don't want to have, you know, <laughs> don't want to hear you, hear you say anything. All right. So people are looking for permission to speak. Let them speak. So a lot of learners think it's a bad thing that they feel shy or they're not feeling confident. It's actually a good thing. Okay. So you can feel Wow, I don't have to worry about myself. I can be a good listener and still respond back to the other person to keep the conversation flowing. All right. And again, we do this. We want to have rapport and we want to develop fluency because fluency comes from us paying attention to what the other people are saying. Okay. That's how we're building fluency. All right. A uh, couple of responses here. Let's see. All right. Julian, again, I prefer not to practice English with another learner because I believe that one bird cannot uh, guide another. Yeah, so if you, I, I also would recommend you, you actually practice with native speakers if you have someone to speak with, if you can. Your accent is very clear, not like all Americans I hear on YouTube. What is the secret? Well, I'm speaking clearly. <laughs> I'm intentionally being clear so people can understand what I'm saying. So what we do in Fluent for Life is we take you from understanding my voice to understanding more difficult native speakers, all right? So it's much more difficult to just to watch me if I'm giving a, like a long explanation or a difficult thing, if I'm using idioms, slang, faster speech, if I'm not communicating accurately, then of course it's going to be more difficult. So a lot of people enjoy watching my videos because they can understand what I'm saying. It's pretty easy, okay? But if I want to take you from this level to understand me, I want to get you out of the, the learning English phase and into the native speaking phase. And so that's where you start understanding more native speakers and you have to learn a lot of the vocabulary and things in steps. If you try to jump directly to that, it's much more difficult. That's why we do it in steps in Fluent for Life. All right, I think native speak too fast. Yes, it just sounds too fast because you're not used to it yet. But when you are used to it, it's actually not very fast at all. All right, but what if I don't have a partner to speak with? What can I do? Again, Isaac, you don't need a person to speak with. This is for if you do have that situation or that opportunity, great. If not, you really get fluent by getting the, uh, the, net, the naturally varied review, the, comp the comprehensible input. So it's just understandable messages that you get from native speakers. But the point is to focus on that for a long time. So I don't, like this example here, I don't watch just one video about how to do something. I watch a whole bunch of videos about how to do something. I listen to many people speaking about how to do that thing. So if you have not watched it already, I have an example about this specific kind of learning on the channel. It's about how to make espresso. So if you've not seen that video already, go to the channel and watch that because it will show you and make you feel more confident about making espresso even if you don't care about making espresso. So I don't care about making espresso, but now I understand and I could have a conversation with someone about making espresso. Okay, But the point is it's because I watched a couple of different people doing it. All right. It's always important to get lots of real examples and varied examples. That's why this is called naturally varied review, because we want to hear lots of examples the same way natives learn. If you only listen to me or any other teacher, then you will only really, you will really try to focus on sounding exactly like I do, and your voice is going to be different from mine. 
Maybe you have a higher voice or a lower voice, or maybe you don't have the kind of nasally sound that I have in my voice. So my voice sounds a little bit different. And you will feel much more confident if you listen to a varied group of people the same way you got fluent in your native language. So the way you speak is actually a different, it's kind of a combination of all the people, especially when you were young. So your mother and father and any friends or teachers, those are the people that really helped you develop your accent and your pronunciation, but you still have a unique voice. So you should be doing the same thing in English. All right, hablamos, hablamos, como hablamos. Thanks, coach. I agree. Elena says, I suggest that you should make a full video speaking the way you normally do so people can see the difference. So if you go to our channel, uh, you can find conversation videos of me, of me just speaking. I'm like a little bit, a little bit, uh, I'm, not, I'm not as fast as I could be because I really could speak much faster and depending on, on how I'm speaking with people or who I'm speaking with. Uh, like if it's a bit more of a professional situation, I would speak a little bit more like this. But if I'm just talking casually with my friends, it's not even just the speed, it's also the vocabulary that I'm using. So I intentionally am not putting a lot of phrasal verbs or idioms or other things like that in my speech. I really just want to make it understandable, okay? So it's not just the speed of the speech or the accent, the vocabulary is really the most important part of that, or it can be the biggest thing uh, that stops people from understanding. Okay, so you'll see that uh, in those conversation videos. So rather than doing it in this kind of thing, that will help you understand. <clears throat> uh, Nadia says, always with the same response, our child in all language, ja, 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 nothing. I don't know what that means. Let's see. Uh, the more I listen, the more I feel confident in speaking, but I'm still very afraid of making mistakes, says Gilson. Yeah, that's common. Again, if you just respond and repeat what the other person says, you can't really fail. You're just repeating what they said. So that's the easiest way to do that, just to get confident about repeating things. And then the next level up uh, is trying to respond imperfectly. So you don't have to put pressure on yourself to communicate just like a child would, where they're trying to say something and maybe they don't know exactly how to say that. Okay, so there are many ways to say something. There's not only one correct way to say something, so don't put pressure on yourself to do that. It's typical lessons that tell you this is how you say something or this is how you pronounce something. So a perfect example is like if I'm learning uh, like Japanese characters, like how to write something. So if I'm trying to teach my, teach my daughter the alphabet, uh, and if I'm, if I'm being like very precise about the, the language, like if, if I'm uh, teaching her English like that, if I do this, if I do this, I say, look, there's like a certain amount of space between this part of the A and that part of the A. So you, you have to write it perfectly every time. You have to write it like this, like there, there's a certain distance between this line and this line. Now, this is the kind of thing in Japanese that you will see, but often like in real life, there are different fonts. So font like a different way a character might be written. So the letter A might be like this, it might be a little bit closer together. So I'm, I, I don't put a lot of pressure on my, my girls to teach them like you have to write it perfectly like this. What I do is try to give them many examples and say, look, like these are the kinds of things you will see, okay? So like some people will have the letter A like that. Some people will have the letter A like that. Some people will have the letter A like that. They're all correct, okay? So this is why we get naturally varied review. The point is to make you feel confident that, oh yeah, look, the real world is varied like this, okay? So we're not worried about trying to be perfect like all oh, this, and you see this in, in learning Japanese, but when people write normally, like their writing looks, it looks horrible, <laughs> okay? So somebody else asking about writing, the same thing, uh, advice I gave before is actually write stuff. Just find writing and copy it by hand. Uh, the same kind of writing you would like to do. So read more and, and, uh, and write more. Uh, let's see, okay. So if you'd like to, like to hear more of me speaking more normally with more idioms and phrases and things like that, uh, it's in the conversations. This, so this is, again, what we do in Steps in Fluent for Life. Uh, let's see, Fuchan says, I heard someone said, don't keep asking kids what they did at school unless they want to share. Um, 
Yeah, well, it's it's more like hey, letting them know, hey, like we we are interested in what you're doing. I don't force my kids to speak. <laughs> so if they if if I say, hey, what did you do in school today? Uh, and they say nothing, I say, really, you did nothing. And and again, part of my communication with my kids is so that I'm giving them English input. Even if they don't speak, they're still learning the language from me. All right. So part of that is just me, me giving them input. They can listen to me talking about things, and I will say, "Oh, really? Like maybe you like did you did you go to the park today? Did you play with your friends?" So even if they don't speak, even if they didn't do that thing, I'm giving them examples of how that would sound. So sometimes kids don't speak because they don't feel confident about language. Sometimes they're just lazy or they're, they're busy doing something else. So like they're playing with something and I say, hey, what, what did you do today? And they say, I'm, I'm busy. I'm playing with this thing over here. Okay, I'm not going to give them, like I'm not going to force them to speak. All right, but I can, uh, especially if, they, if, they're, if they're listening to me at all, uh, I can give them lots of input. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, next one, uh, I moved in the USA four months ago with intermediate knowledge of English. I participate in ESL classes and training myself, but sometimes I think that I, without progress from that time, can you give me advice? Yes, uh, so I, I, without knowing more about your situation, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. I can't read the uh, Cyrillic there. Um, but if you, it, you can live in the United States, but still learn the traditional way. So there's nothing magical about being in the United States except you have more opportunity to listen to uh, English input. But now you can do that on the internet anywhere. So it doesn't like there's there's no like additional benefit of being in the United States other than maybe having some opportunity to to communicate with people. All right, but you can still get fluent anywhere in the world by yourself if you get naturally varied review. So if you're getting lots of examples from people, you're hearing how natives are communicating, and that's what's making you feel much more confident about the language. So if you're in the United States, you should be doing these things up here. If you're in a position where you can talk with people, if you have that opportunity, then you can either repeat after them or you can respond imperfectly to that person or after getting naturally varied review and you feel confident about using something, making your own complete sentences, all right? So these are the things you can do, but they're not necessary. If you just want to learn by yourself, just getting more naturally varied review is perfectly fine, but it doesn't matter where you live if you're still learning like a student. You want to be learning like a native English speaker. So that's the, the most general basic advice for people for improving grammar, pronunciation, uh, listening, vocabulary, everything. Do what native speakers are doing. Copy native speakers if you want to sound like native speakers, if you want to speak like native speakers. If you want to speak like a student, then do what students do. All right? It's, it's really that simple. So how you learn is how you speak. Uh, let's see. I have arrived uh, late. Or I have arrived right now. It's okay, Lewis. No worries. You can, you can watch that. Uh, <laughs> Everybody loves the cha-cha-cha. Let's see. All right, Tim. Ah, that's your name? Oh, okay. Well, really, that's your name? Your name is Tim? Or oh, if you're not speaking to somebody else. Or maybe that's like Tim Timothy or something like that. Something longer, I'm guessing. So little children love the cha-cha-cha. Ah, okay. How many words do we need to be able to speak fluently in English? Has anyone heard my response to that already? Because I've given it many times. I bet someone else in the chat can answer that if nobody does. Uh, everyone should know the answer to that question, but I can answer that if so. If nobody does, I want to see if anybody knows my answer to that. How many words do you need to speak fluently? How many words? Uh, so let's see, Trunks. I just finished 50 lessons of uh, uh, no Nihongo, ne? Uh, Jap at Japanese Teaching Center. What do I do next to improve my Japanese? Well, how is your how is your Japanese? Not like can you can you can you understand everyday conversations? So I, I think I, I think I remember like Mina no Nihongo, uh, like I, I, that was a textbook many years ago uh, that I looked at. I think I stopped using that. Uh, but you should be getting more uh, input from people from native Japanese speakers. If you're in if you're in Japan, I don't know if you're in Japan or not. Uh, oh, it is Timothy. Okay. Uh, but yeah. So if you. Um, 
Yeah, if you, you didn't say so, Japanese teaching center. I don't know if that if you're in Japan doing that or not, but you should be getting more naturally varied review in Japanese. So find things you're interested in at your level and get lots of that input. So like reading、uh, Doraemon is something I'm doing. So as an example, see if I have that. So just reading,、uh, reading is an excellent way to do that. And bam, look at that. It's a bunch of stories that have a similar. Like similar vocabulary level because this is written for young kids,、uh, and so like some of the vocabulary I don't know, but most of it I do, so I can learn new things. Like oh yeah, look at that! Like I just learned some new vocabulary. So discovery, I talk about that in my recent video about the four different levels of learning,、uh, and discovery is really the highest level for being able to when you discover something yourself. Like ah, like I actually figured that out for myself. So you should be getting at your level, so something you can understand maybe eighty to ninety percent of, and that will help you feel much more confident about that. So learn with that, whatever whatever the thing is you're interested in.、Um, okay, how can we make the letter T sound like the D, like a native speaker? You should get Frederick. So we cover that in Frederick,、uh, and you listen to the different examples of that. You can compare those. Uh, but this is listening to words. You learn the individual sounds of words, and then also hear how words blend together. So you should be doing that in Frederick.、Uh, you can click on the link in the description below to do that.、Uh, did you ever listen to James Taylor songs? I don't know if that's for me or not, but、uh, probably. Thank you for your feedback, says Timothy. My pleasure. All right, Shibun says.、Uh, Shibun says two thousand five hundred words. Twenty five hundred words. You just need the words you have. As long as you practice, you can speak. Should be fluently. Yes, that's correct.、Uh, you speak very clearly. I didn't understand when Canadians spoke because it's so fast. Could you please give me advice for understanding when people speak? Thank you.、And、remember, there are many. There are many pieces of this. All right. Let me answer both of these questions. All right. So the first question was, how many words do you need to speak fluently?、Uh, and the answer, my answer specifically, is that you, there it's the wrong question to ask. The question is, how well do you know the individual vocabulary? Because you get fluent word by word as you understand that vocabulary. So if I teach you some words, so if I just give you a translation or a definition, translation or a definition, translation or a definition. Of these, but this one, wow! I'm actually going into a lot of detail, and I cover this word a lot. You will be fluent in this word. You will feel confident using this. You will not become fluent in these. You will not feel confident using them. All right. So people think that fluency is something that happens after you learn enough vocabulary. They think that you like. Okay, I learned one word, and I, I can't speak because I only have one word. Now I know two words, ten words, twenty words. I keep learning more and more, but they still can't speak. They think, okay, maybe if I get ah, okay, I got twenty five hundred words now. Like Bing, now magically I can speak. But that's never happened to anyone ever. Okay, like maybe someone could find an example of someone. I would love to meet that person who couldn't speak, and then so they were at word like twenty four ninety nine, and they couldn't speak. But then they get to word like twenty five hundred, and then they could speak. As I don't think that's ever happened ever. Okay, so the goal here is to become fluent in individual words and phrases. You become fluent in individual words and phrases as you understand them very well. So you feel confident about using them. You erase the doubts in your mind about is this the right tense? Am I using this the right way? Is the pronunciation correct? All right. So if you just get a, a quick definition of something like this, okay, I'm going to try to learn ten new words every day. I have my flashcards, and that's it. You're going to waste your time trying to learn more and more and more, and you will probably go past 2,500 words. All right, but no one, maybe someone could prove me wrong. That would be amazing if I met someone like that. But I have never met anyone who could not speak for the first 24. 99 words, so the first 2,499 words. But finally, when they learned that next word, bam! Magically, they became able to speak. I don't think that's ever happened to anyone. Okay, what actually does happen is you get fluent in individual words and phrases, and then because you can use these words individually, you can connect them together to make longer sentences. It's that simple. 
So most people, they don't spend enough time actually getting, like they're going deeper into the language to really learn more about those specific words and phrases. And that's why they can't speak, okay? So it's not how many words you know, it's how well you know the vocabulary, all right? So these ones, again, not all words are created equal in your mind. Some of them, maybe you've heard them once or twice, you don't really feel very confident about using them, but other words, maybe you've heard them many times. Lots of people have said that word to you. It's like a young child hears the word stop or don't do that, you know, like 20 times a day at least. So of course they know don't do that. You know, they, their parents are like, no, no, don't, don't do that, don't touch that. <laughs> Kids, kids hear the word don't. It's like the first word they learn, don't. <laughs> okay? So the point is that they hear, so they are fluent in the word don't, but maybe they are not fluent in the word electricity. All right? So if we have like a, I don't know, a higher level word uh, like status as an example. So my, my, my children, maybe they have heard that word before, but I, they would not be able to use that in a sentence. So they are fluent in the word don't. They are not fluent in the word status. Okay? All right. So Seda says, I know 5,000 words, but I can't speak English fluently. Yes. Another perfect example of people continuing to do this. And if you have done this, don't feel bad. This is the way everybody, really, like almost everybody, I don't do this, but this is the way almost everybody teaches any language. The point is to get more and more vocabulary instead of knowing the vocabulary you have very well. So this is why I tell students, hey, I can actually help you become a more confident speaker without learning more words. It's true. People think, well, that's impossible. You can't help me become more fluent without learning more vocabulary. How can you do that? And the interesting thing is, look, it's because I can take the vocabulary you already know and help you use it better, help you know it better, help you understand the pronunciation and the uses of the things you already know. Is everybody getting this? Does this make sense? So when people ask how many words do you need to speak fluently, one word, really? Either you can use the word fluently or you cannot, all right? And then over time, if you have a bunch of words that you can use fluently, you begin to weave them together into fluent conversations. But if you don't first get the individual words fluent, if you don't get fluent in that vocabulary, then of course you can't have longer conversations. And that's why we have Naturally Varied Review up here as the main driver, the main thing, the main foundation of fluent communication. So if you're in a conversation and you don't feel confident about anything because you really don't know anything you're saying, you've studied a whole bunch of words but you still can't speak, just mirror people. If you feel a little bit more confident, you can respond and try to express what you want to say, even if it's imperfect. But if you're getting naturally varied review, you will communicate fluently. That's all I'm doing right now, all right? I did not become fluent in English because I lived in the United States. I became fluent because of how I learned. So there are, I can imagine, there are non-native speakers living in the United States. Maybe some people have been living in the United States for 20 years, 30 years. 40 years, and they still can't speak. Think about that. They probably know a lot of words, but they still can't speak, all right? So notice how these things are connected together. Uh, if you want to become a fluent speaker, you have to become fluent in the individual words and phrases. It's pretty, it makes, it makes sense, doesn't it? Okay, so either you do this or you do this. And I like to, I like to do this up here. And it's more interesting too. You get lots of, the, the whole point of getting naturally varied review is that it's interesting each time you hear a different person talking about something or you hear it in a different tense or in a different setting. Like I just showed you the example of uh, Doraemon here for learning Japanese. So I might like read something here and then I hear it in a different place, all right? Now I want to be clear, uh, so she is saying uh, repetition is the key. I'm not saying that straight repetition is the key. This is the, like the core difference for what I'm talking about. This is the difference between naturally varied review and repetition. Repetition means I take a flashcard and I repeat the exact same thing over and over and over again, where I only listen to one speaker over and over and over again. What I really want to do is get lots of different speakers or I want to focus on different things like even listening to me in this conversation right now. 
maybe the first time you watch this video, it's just listening. Okay, how is Drew speaking about this? How is he asking questions? What's his intonation like? I'm focusing on a particular thing, okay? And the next time I watch the video, I focus on something else. So it's not just repeating the same thing. Uh, it's not like shadowing the same thing either. The point is I'm getting naturally varied review. I don't have to speak. I'm just listening to other people. And it's not even just listening. I'm, I'm like watching people or reading something or writing something or listening to people on the radio or TV. I'm getting lots of different input. And the whole point of that is to get me fluent in that particular vocabulary. Because when I feel confident about that, then I can speak, all right? It's the doubts you have about vocabulary or pronunciation or whatever that stop you from speaking. It means you don't know the vocabulary as well as you think you do. And so you overcome this by getting naturally varied review, reviewing that, uh, reviewing that thing again and again. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, let's see. All right, so answer, yes, I'll go back to answer, uh, is our, our let, okay, can't see that L or for, if it's an L or an I. So our let is asking uh, how to understand uh, like Canadian speakers or American speakers or whatever. So remember that there are different parts of speech. Now we can just break this down very simply. So we've got the accent. And again, you can, you can even maybe put it into more pieces than this, but the basic idea is the accent and pronunciation. So the pronunciation, we'll just call this the sound of the language. And we've got the speed, and then we've got the vocabulary. And vocabulary means the grammar and the words. So we we'll just call this vocab. All right, if I put you in a conversation, so imagine like there are two, two speakers over here. So these are both native English speakers. If I put you in a conversation with them, it would probably pretty, be pretty difficult for many, for many learners. Maybe the people watching this video also might be difficult for them. All right, and the reason it's difficult is because we've got maybe some difficult accents. Maybe people aren't communicating clearly. They're mumbling their words. It's going to be fast, so that's a lot of information to process at the same time if you're not familiar with it. And of course, they're going to have slang, idioms, and other things like that that make it more difficult. Okay? So, how do we complicate this, like, or how do we, how do we take this complication and simplify it? We want to split these up into different pieces so you learn each of them individually. All right? We want to take the conversation and break it down into different pieces. All right, so we want to help you understand the vocabulary. So here's some of the key vocabulary that you will hear in the conversation. Here is the, that same vocabulary at different speeds. So you can get used to hearing it, hearing it at different accents. So hearing different speakers, again, we're trying to control how we learn that. Uh, and then we also want to hear, of course, like the slang. We're trying to learn uh, like maybe some of the grammar and understand how that works. And if you take these different pieces and you learn them, when you get back to the conversation again, it becomes a lot easier to understand. All right? This is what we do in Fluent for Life. So we're taking a conversation and we're separating it into different pieces so you can go through these. And again, the naturally varied review that comes is by getting all these in different ways. So we're going to read, listen, write some of that. Read, listen, write some of that too. And each time we go through these, we feel a bit more confident. We learn a little bit more. And that's how we understand that, okay? So it's very difficult to start over here and jump right to the conversation. That's what people are complaining about. They're saying, ah, I can't understand Canadians or Americans or whatever, okay? So if you go from here to here, it's going to be frustrating, most likely. But if you go from here to here, ah, okay, I understand this. And then here to here, ah, okay, I understand a little bit more. Now here to here, I understand more. And then finally you get back to this and now you understand a lot more and you feel much more confident about that, okay? So it's the review and then we, this is just one conversation. We go do that with another one and another one and another one and another one. And over time you get fluent just like natives do, but it's just a much more systematic approach than how native speakers learn the language. So it's really even better than learning the same way a native would, okay? So that's how you do it. It's really, it's really impossible, or not impossible, but very difficult to try to go from uh, by yourself to try to understand conversations. It's 
much easier and you will feel much better if you do it in little steps in the same way you're like try to walk across a room i can try to jump across the room that's going to be difficult or i can just take some simple steps and i'll get across the room quite quickly all right remember that naturally varied review is what we use to build the habit of communication we're not trying to memorize a bunch of vocabulary words and then forget them in conversations we want the habit of using these things fluently and automatically all right do i understand or speak german no i do not all right, so I could stop learning from live internet face-to-face -face teaching. It cost me a lot of money, actually. Yes, absolutely. I don't, I don't learn Japanese from live face-to-face -face lessons. And again, the reason I don't do that is because most of the time it's going to be more of the same, like it's going to be more of the same lessons that don't actually help me speak. All right? Even me, I don't recommend you only watch videos of me. Like, I know I think I'm amazing, but I don't want you to do that. If you only watch videos of me, it's not going to get you to the highest level. Okay? You really need to listen to me and other speakers. Or maybe you don't like listening to me and you listen to somebody else. That's fine. Whatever you want to do, it needs to be a mix of naturally varied review. Okay? That's the whole reason we do this. The whole point is to simulate the native environment. And so if you're, it doesn't matter if you're in a live class, like sitting in a classroom, like I used to teach in the classroom, uh, or you are, are learning through online teachers. If they're teaching you like a student, then you're going to be stuck at the student level. Okay? All right, Neil says I make a great job. Glad to hear it. All right, glad to hear I'm being helpful over here. All right, so let's go back and answer some more questions. I, I really want to spend time on these things so people understand the answers to them. It's also good to have that review. So I'm, I'm not trying to repeat. I want to give you maybe different stories each time, explain with different examples, and that's going to help you become a much more confident speaker. All right, so mom says, I can understand English, but I can't speak. Yes, so again, like we will hear, we will still see people in this video and every other video I do and every other video that you find about learning English with people talking about this same problem. I understand, but I can't speak. I understand, but I can't speak. Okay? And the reason is they don't know the vocabulary as well as they think they do. Having a definition or a translation or a passive understanding of something is not the same thing as knowing it and using it fluently. All right. If you want to be able to communicate, you have to know it fluently. All right. Really, just think more about fluent understanding of the language rather than uh, like trying to speak. So you want to have fluent understanding. All right. Uh, let's see. All right. So Ilda says, "When you in Rome do that, the Romans do." Yes. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Yeah. So learn like a native if you want to speak like a native. Liz, again, thanks, teacher, for your class. I will continue tomorrow because it is a little late where I live. Okay. Demi says, does not depend on how much words you know. It is important is understanding. Yes, correct. Julian says, when it comes to speaking, uh, I believe the key is to focus on the situation rather than specific words you want to use. Yes. So this is what I recommend. So you, you begin with a situation because that's how natives are learning the language. So a, a child in one family might hear different vocabulary than a child in another for the same situation. So mom says, clean up your room. Another mom says, clean your room. Another mom says, tidy up your room. Another mom says, what are you doing? Put your toys away. You hear lots of different people explaining things in different ways. So if you dwell too much on the words themselves, you might find yourself mentally translating them. Yes, however, if you concentrate on the situation, uh, the appropriate words will naturally come to your mind. Yeah, so this is what I teach. Again, this is the same way you get fluent in your native language. That's why it works. All right, uh, let's see. And if you, okay, answer that question. But yeah, very good, you got it. So I said, uh, I know five, okay, answer that one already. Uh, it's about being a confident, a uh, he, he. Olga says, I guess our fluent depends on the environment we're in. For example, our job. Uh, no, it's helpful. But again, you are watching me right now and you are improving your fluency just listening to this video or watching this video uh, wherever you are in the world. So you create that environment yourself. This is what we do in Fluent for Life. You don't need to be in a particular place. I can get fluent in Japanese anywhere. And actually, I improved a lot of my Japanese in the United States. Just learning by myself and trying to get input from Japanese people. I actually worked at a, I worked at a, a Japanese restaurant in the United States. And in there, most of that was me not speaking Japanese. It was just listening to people speak. 
All right, repetition. Okay, I answered that one already. So between pronunciation and fluency, which one should be improved first? Uh, it depends on how bad your pronunciation is. Most people, their pronunciation is okay. Uh, or at least like you can, you can kind of understand what they're saying. It might not be perfect, but like grammar is the most important thing because that's, you know, trying to actually communicate correctly is more important than, than like sounding perfect. So if I'm saying the wrong thing or explaining something incorrectly, then that's going to be worse. So what if native speakers don't get me when I speak because I have an accent even though it is not a thick accent? Yep, then uh, I would just try to ask them like, oh, if, you're, if, if they're having a, a problem understanding you, it's usually because they're not prepared for that accent. So you could, again, get more, try to improve your own accent by listening to different native speakers. Uh, and so if you listen to lots of people like what I'm talking about with Naturally Varied Review, um, or you could just ask them like, how can you like make a game out of it? Ask them how to, how to pronounce something. A lot of people are actually kind of happy to help out with that uh, if, you can, if you can make it make it more of a game. So like, oh, like, can, you, can you say this word for me? Maybe I have like two or three different Japanese speakers. I like, can do the same thing with uh, English speakers. So you see these videos on YouTube sometimes. It's like an American and an Australian speaking English or whatever. Um, so you can get a couple of different people to give you live naturally varied review and just say, hey, I'd really like to improve my pronunciation so I'm understood. Can you help me do that? <laughs> and, you know, if it's for work or something, then often people would, would be willing to do that. They might not be able to teach you the language, but certainly everybody understands pronunciation. And so they can, you don't have to have them like coach you about that, but just to hear them speaking and then watch how they move and you'll, you'll get very good at pronunciation that way. Otto says, my click to be confident uh, speaking was taking, uh, talking to an officer in my first visit to the US. He tried to speak Spanish once I'm from Brazil and I asked him just to speak Spanish. Uh, slower, I could understand his words. Yep, you can just ask people to speak more slowly. That's it too. So it's good to sing to practice speaking. Yep, you can you can sing. Yeah, that's another another way as well. Ellen says, "I finally uh, understand your way of teaching. I was at my at a restaurant the other day, and my husband asked the waitress for a doggy bag, and she didn't understand. So I told her it was a to-go box. Yep, boom." There you go. And so it, it, even like as a, as a non-native speaker, if you ask for something like, oh, can I have a, like a doggy bag or whatever? Like not everybody knows the same vocabulary. And that's why native speakers are prepared for lots of different people like using the vocabulary that they know or, or learning the different vocabulary or even just understanding what you mean by something like, oh, we need a box to go. Okay. So I think it's yeah, excellent. Uh, very good that, you, that you're figuring that out. Sometimes, you know, we need lots of examples to, to, to really make that point clear. But remember that these are the, th the same things that you will experience in your native language. All right. Let's see. I want to read more. Yes, you can definitely do that. Uh, let's see. So my strategy is to listen to anyone speaking in English, such as news broadcasts from BBC and Fox, as well as different accents. Yep. All right, so I speak three languages a day. A lot of times my brain freezes when I talk as a paralegal. Uh, I don't feel confident enough pursuing my career. What to do? Oh my goodness. Well, you'd have to think about what, what the, I don't know, maybe either, either you're trying to, like your, your frustration is about the career itself or just the language use. Maybe you can focus on a particular language and just use that one uh, or get a different career. You know, <laughs> depends on what, what the specific issue is. All right, I recorded myself, then I listened to me trying to improve my accent, maybe reading a book. Yep, you can do that, but again, if you just get naturally varied review, it will improve you a lot more than taking time to record yourself. You can do that, but uh, if you, the more review you get from other people, that's going to get you fluent much faster. Because the goal is not, not, not only to just hear your own voice, uh, which is often like kind of weird for people. They're like, ooh, I don't, I don't like the sound of my voice, you know. Uh, but if you can get lots of input from other people, that will make you feel much more confident. So it's about uh, reducing the doubt that you have in your mind. Uh, let's see. 100% gratitude, says Omar. It's my pleasure. All right. Uh, and Shibin, how to get rid of the native accent influence? You get naturally varied review. So you listen to lots of different people talking about something. So you listen to the same song sung by different people. 
or you listen to like the same speech, or even just just hearing a, a different different group of people speak, and you will hear them say the same words in different ways, and so that will help you improve your own accent as well. Because you, you don't want to try to have one one. I mean, you could have one person. Maybe you want to sound like a particular actor or something, but your voice will always sound a little bit different, even if you're even if you can mimic them perfectly, if you can copy them perfectly. Um, so just find a kind of range of people. And then listen to them, and then you can find a good, uh, a good spot for your voice in there. I've been pushing myself to read, says Otto, some English books through Kindle. It is a great tool to learn in, uh, some vocabulary, but I have to practice right away at my job to fix it in my mind. Yeah. So again, using uh, the vocabulary is, is one way to, to make it more memorable. Like if you can kind of stress yourself out a little bit, uh, it, it might not be the best way to learn, but you can learn that way. So if, I'm, if I really need to know some vocabulary for a particular speaking session or whatever, uh, then I can, I can do that and I can have, I, I might remember the vocabulary, but it's much easier if I just hear that same vocabulary from a bunch of different people or review it in different ways. So if I see it in a movie or hear it on the radio or TV, uh, read it in a book or whatever, the, that will actually help me remember the vocabulary and feel much more confident about it that way. All right, Amanda says, dang, it means my English is so bad I don't even have those mix of environments. Yeah, again, you don't need to be in a different environment. You can do that right on YouTube. It's pretty easy. So right now you can bring the English-speaking world to you. So when you're out on the, the bus or the train or at work or whatever, you can get that information uh, anywhere, okay? So that you don't need to go anywhere or do anything. It's all right here. If you're watching this video right now, this is one example of this. This is a person speaking pretty clear English and helping you get some, some tips about learning the language. Uh, obviously, you can learn how I'm communicating, and if you focus on, like, how is Drew saying this, and how is he moving from one thing to the next, if you really pay attention, you will learn a lot about that uh, without even me giving you a lesson about it. This is how kids are learning. They're paying attention to what their kids are doing or what their parents are doing uh, or even what other kids are doing. And so if you're listening to people, uh, you don't need to go anywhere. You can just get that information right here, like I do in that espresso video. Again, this is what we do in Fluent for Life. So we've got all these conversations, all of the learning, thousands of vocabulary words, grammar, pronunciation, all that taught just step by step in the program. It's already ready and waiting for people. So you don't have to go anywhere or do anything. All right. Let's see here. All right, Fuchan says, so the point is speaking, how do I improve my writing? I'm stuck uh, tra typing sometimes, even though I'm going to help uh, Google help to write your word. Ah, so again, if, you're, if, you're, if you mean like how to write better, again, looking at more examples of how people do it, the same way you would learn to speak is really the same way you would learn to write. So you're getting lots of examples of how other people do it. Uh, is accent different than dialogue? Well, dialogue means like you're having some kind of communication between uh, two people. An accent is just the, the sound of your voice. Like the, if you have a particular, like I can tell you're from a particular place by how you sound. The difference is in your, in your voice. Uh, how can I improve my listening skills? Same thing. Listen to lots of different people. Naturally varied review. Naturally varied review solves all. Look at that. It's amazing. Remember, how do you improve your listening in your native language? Same answer. All right, uh, so I should focus on the situation and not the words. Yes, so Mikhail says uh, focus on the situation. Again, if you, you begin with a situation, like a focus of some kind, so you want to learn a particular word or you want to learn how to talk about something, just like I do in that espresso video. So in that video, the situation is how to make an espresso. And so I watch a couple of different people do that, and I hear how some of them use the same vocabulary. Maybe some people use different vocabulary, but I become more confident as I get these different examples. All right, so remember, like, the, the way to learn it as a student is you begin with a word in your native language and then try to translate that. So it really stops you from having a much wider use of the language because either you know that one word or you forget it in conversations. But a native speaker doesn't learn the vocabulary that way. They learn it by beginning with the situation. So they see, what do native speakers say in this situation? So what do I say when I'm teaching? What do I say when I'm, uh, I don't know, ordering some food on the phone? Hello? Yes, I'd like to place an order for something. 
Now, I might say it that way, but someone else might say it differently, and that's why we get naturally varied review. The point is not to have a single point of failure, all right? So you don't want to have like one, one point of failure. Like a spider web example I often give. So if you've ever touched a spider web before, you know it's a little bit, a little bit sticky, and you can rip a hole in a spider web, but it's, it's, it's quite difficult to rip the whole thing down. I mean, you could, I guess, if you took a big stick or something and just, Wah, that's the end of it. But in general, a spider web is really, is really strong. And it's strong because all of the different connections there. And so that's how native speakers are learning the language. And so if they forget a word, that's what we're talking about, about responding imperfectly in this video. If they forget one word, it doesn't matter because they just switch to another one. So it's the same situation, but maybe they express it in a different way. So different vocabulary, or maybe they, I don't know, they think about something completely different, like a completely different topic, or go on to something else. I've given the example many times of native speakers, and again, this is native English speakers not knowing how to spell a word. So they might be writing something, like writing it by hand. It's easy if you have a computer because the computer will spell check you. But if you're writing something by hand, they might think, how do I spell that word? I don't know how to spell restaurant or whatever. <laughs> so they can't remember how to spell it. So they switch to a different word, okay? And so they write that one because they can spell it. Same idea. So you begin, okay, I can't remember that word, let me switch to something else. That's because we're learning from situations, not trying to have that. There is, there is no one single point of failure in this. All right? All right, let's see how much time we have left. Oh my goodness, we gotta shut this down. We're at 100 minutes. You guys are keeping me, keeping me way too long over here. All right. Uh, I think part of being fluent is also when to pause and when talking, don't you think so? Yes, so obviously there will be some, some pausing in conversations. All right, context is super important. We need real situations, yes, yes. How can I learn phrasal verbs? Uh, we have that in Fluent for Life, so the visual guide to phrasal verbs is in there. You should be learning them visually, just like native speakers do, and then understanding the more figurative uses of those as well. All right, uh, and last, last questions there from Trin. How can I learn the intonation and accent? Again, you wanna hear a lot of different people and that will, that will help you understand the accent, the intonation. And this is what we do in Frederick as well. So you're listening to my voice, but you're hearing it kind of in different ways. You're learning the vocabulary, hearing it in sentences as well. But then you should also hear it from many different people. So all these things, whether it's pronunciation, accent, vocabulary, grammar, all those things, this is everything we cover in Fluent for Life, which you can learn more about by clicking on the link in the description below this video. All right, Neil says, good night and thanks a lot. So you would say either thanks lots or thanks a lot. Both of those are fine. But that's a good note to end on, 101 minutes. Oh my goodness, I need to rest my voice. But if, again, if you'd like to learn more about how we get you fluent automatically by following these same principles, you can click on the links in the description below this video. Get Frederick, get Fluent for Life, and get fluent. Have a fantastic day, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.